the second week of our Come to Worship message series. And during this series, we're looking at four different aspects or attitudes of worship that can help you more passionately worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus, born in Bethlehem on that first Christmas. Last week, we looked at lifting up holy hands to God as an act of worship. And if you missed that message, you can catch it online at hollychurch.org. Today, we're going to look at another very powerful way to worship Jesus, and that's by bringing our gifts before God as an act of worship. The wise men have been watching for the birth of Jesus since the days of Daniel the prophet. Daniel lives 500 years before Jesus is born, but he's watching for Jesus' birth. And he teaches others to do the very same thing, even after his death. Daniel's part of a group of men known as wise men, or magi, that for generation after generation, this group watches for the sign of Jesus' birth. And how blessed those wise men must have felt who see the sign in the heavens, a star. Generation after generation of wise men have lived and passed away, but this generation of wise men will be the ones who actually get to worship Jesus, the newborn king. They travel by following the star, and the star leads them to the country of Judea and to the capital city of Jerusalem, and then when they get there, the star disappears. How confusing. And disappointing that must have been. But the wise men don't give up. They press on. They press on in faith. And they begin asking around the city, where's the Messiah? Where's the newborn king? Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, King Herod, the king of Judea, the king of the Jews, he's a very jealous king. And when it comes to his attention, there's wise men in the city asking about the birth of a newborn king that perks up his ears, a newborn king of the Jews. Now, Inwardly, this very much upsets King Herod, the king of the Jews. But 
He's a very shrewd man, and he goes to the religious leaders, and he asks them, you know, if there's a Messiah, where is he supposed to be born? And they tell him, in Bethlehem. So then King Herod, he calls the wise men to him secretly. He has a secret meeting with them and says, hey, I can help you out. I found out where the newborn king, the Messiah, is to be born. He's to be born in Bethlehem. And if you find him, come back and let me know so I can go worship him too. Now, Herod doesn't believe in a Messiah. That's probably why he doesn't travel with the wise men in the first place. But he's a shrewd man, and so he hedges his bet. He says, if you find him, come back and let me know so I can go worship him. Now, Herod had no designs of worshiping Jesus. He would have killed Jesus and taken care of any threat, perceived threat to his throne very quickly. After the wise men's secret meeting with King Herod, it says in Matthew 2, 9, and having heard the king, they went their way because they don't know uh, Herod's real designs for Jesus. Now, I want you to consider, though, the magnitude of what the wise men have done, even getting this far, getting to the city of Jerusalem. They have traveled 900 miles, and that's 900 miles without, you know, any modern uh, uh, forms of travel. This would be like you traveling from Oregon to Wyoming, and there's an old Oregon trail map coming up here, and you can see in the middle of it where Wyoming is, And where Oregon is, and that's a four to six month journey without modern vehicles. And that's how far these guys have traveled. So the wise men travel this vast distance to worship Jesus. They follow the sign of his birth, a star, and then the star disappears. But now they have this renewed energy after leaving uh, their meeting with King Herod because they found out Jesus is to be born in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is about six miles away from Jerusalem, a lot less distance than the 900 miles they've already traveled. Now, but then they're thinking, you know, the stars disappeared. You know, what does this mean? Is uh, Jesus not coming now? Has his birth been delayed for some reason? The wise men have no idea. But again, they press on in faith. And then Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. In other words, they were overjoyed. Matthew uses four different Greek words for joy here to try to get across how filled with joy these guys were. Because for years they have anticipated this moment, the birth of Jesus, the one who can save us from our sins. And so from the depths of their souls, from their very beings, they are overjoyed with a ginormous, big, gigantic joy. The wise men are overjoyed. And Christians should be the most overjoyed people around because God loves us and because He offers us, in fact, if you are a Christian, you've received the gift of salvation. He offers us the gift of salvation, a gift we could never earn on our own. And I know there are difficult seasons in life, but does it do you any good? And I'm speaking to myself here, too, because I tend to fall into this trap. Does it do you any good to be underjoyed? Does it solve any of your problems? Does it make the pain go away? Does it make it better? You know, if you're mad, if you're angry, if you're upset, if you're critical or you're nitpicky about everything? Listen, if you're overjoyed, then tell your face, smile, let people around you know you are overjoyed. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be full of more joy than can be contained because No matter how hard life gets, you have the promise of eternity. You have your God with you always. Jesus is always with you. He is working in all things to bring about good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Don't live your life underjoyed. Again, how does it help you when you do so? 
Instead, be overjoyed. You have a Savior. The wise men travel 900 miles. They see the star. The star disappears. They don't give up. In faith, they press forward. The star returns. They are overjoyed. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees and worshiped him. And how do they worship him? And opening their treasure chests, they gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They're overjoyed to give. They're falling to their knees. Uh, These are monetary financial gifts that they're giving to Jesus to worship him. And they're not upset about giving. They're overjoyed about giving. Giving financially to the Lord is an act of worship. And we follow in the footsteps of those uh, wise men in our in-person services. When we worship through giving, we will say, hey, we're going to worship through giving. And people clap and they cheer and holler because we're overjoyed to be able to worship Jesus in that way. No matter what the amount is, we're just overjoyed. We're able to give to our Lord and Savior Jesus just as the wise men gave. You know, they aren't underjoyed when they give, they're overjoyed. And I want us to be overjoyed when we give. And I want to encourage you to give with joy. And some of you already do so. But, you know, if you haven't discovered the joy of giving to the Lord yet, I want you to begin to find that joy today. Now, I understand some of you are stressed and anxious about money and Christmas is coming up. And so I've got a free resource to help you and anyone you want to give it to you can give this resource away to others just as a gift from Holly Church. And this resource is a completely paid for subscription to Ramsey Plus. And if you haven't received the link for this yet, you can pick it up at an in-person service or you can request it on your connection card and we'll send you the link. If you haven't opened up your connection card page for this week yet, you do so by clicking on the link in the description. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, or clicking the tab right below this video if you're at Holly Church online. Ramsey Plus gives you access to all the financial expertise of Dave Ramsey and his team so you can become financially stable and healthy as you put in the effort to do so. On your connection card, you can also request a link for a list of 25 tips to save money this Christmas. I want to help you in any way I can so you're not financially uh, stressed, but instead you're an overjoyed, generous person. And I know some of you right now, if you're being honest, you're, you're not really givers, or if you are, you're kind of a reluctant giver, you're not a cheerful giver, and I want and I'm praying for God to work a miracle in you. Because I want something for you, not something from you. And God blesses cheerful givers. So my hope is that the Spirit of God will work in you uh, through this message. And And if you don't love giving now, you'll start to love to give. Do you love God? You know, if your answer is yes, think about this. Love gives, doesn't it? When you love someone, you want to give to them. When Christmas time rolls around, a few times in the past, my wife Jennifer and I have said to each other, no gifts this Christmas, and then we proceed to break that rule every time we've said it. Why is that? Because love gives, and Jennifer and I love each other. The most well-known verse in the Bible, even if you're not a Christian, uh, most people know this verse from the Bible. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Now, why does he give? Love. For God so loved the world. And what he gave is more valuable than gold or money. He gave his one and only son. Love gives. Sin separates. It separates us from our Creator. And the only way we can be made right with our Creator is if someone valuable enough dies in our place for our sin. So someone valuable enough 
And someone who doesn't sin has to die for us, has to die for you, for our sin. And out of love, God becomes flesh in the person of Jesus, lives a perfect life, dies on a cross for us, rises again. <clears throat> and all those who put their trust in him will be saved. Jesus says in Mark chapter 16, 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And if you believe and you're ready to be baptized into Jesus, we have our last baptism Sunday coming up at our in-person services, Sunday, December 17th. You can sign up for that on your connection card, and we'll be in touch with you. Love gives. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, we didn't deserve his love. Christ died for us. God didn't just talk about loving us. He demonstrated it. He put it into action by sending Jesus to die for us. Now, as I talk about giving and loving God, I know some of you would say, well, I really love God. I do love God, but giving is just hard for me. I'd love to give, but I've got financial pressure. You know, I love God, but I'm, I'm afraid to give, or I'm hesitant to give, or I'm reluctant to give. Okay, I want to try to uh, bring this around so you see this maybe in a new light that you've never looked at it before in. Can you trust Yahweh God? Yahweh's his personal name. Can you trust Yahweh God? Well, of course you can. And here's what he says to you. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Well, I'm not sure how I could ever give. No, no, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't try to figure it out. Trust God. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and stay away from evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor. Honor means to adore. It means to worship. Worship Yahweh with your wealth. With the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And some people say, you know, how does God want me to worship First fruits, you know? I don't have any fruit trees. Well, here's what it means. First fruits. It means you give to God first. Specifically, you bring him uh, your best first. You bring him his 10%, 10% of what you receive, and you bring it to him, and you give it to him. Recently, a member of our church family stopped by the church office, and in the course of our conversation, they said to me, I always give to God first. It's the first check I write before paying any bills. That is first fruits. They're demonstrating what it means to uh, give to God first, the first fruits, giving to him first. We bring God our best and our first, the first 10%, and we trust him with the rest. I can always spot in an in-person service those who tithe because they're generally, uh, when I talk about this stuff, they're generally smiling like this and shaking their heads, yes, and they recognize 90% is greater with God's blessing upon it than 100% is. It's a supernatural experience. It's trusting in the Lord Yahweh with all your heart, not leaning on your own understanding, honoring him with my first and my best, and trusting him to bless the rest. Now, I'm overjoyed to worship God by bringing his tithe and my offerings to him. I never miss the money I give to the Lord. And I, I give to the Lord because God is so good. But there's more to giving in worship than giving money. Now, we do honor God. We do worship him by giving financially to him as an act of worship. But there's something even greater we are to give. Our lives. Giving myself to the Lord is an act of worship. The Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 
Therefore, I urge you, dear friends, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, everything I have, everything I am, I give it all to you. I surrender it all to you, Lord. It's yours. The wise men, they give of themselves by traveling 900 miles to worship Jesus. And they give of their wealth because they're overjoyed to offer that worship to Jesus. They open up their treasures, you know, worshiping him him by giving financially to him. And they bow their knees, worshiping him by giving themselves to him. To the Lord. Let's take a moment. I want you to reflect as we pray. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, I humbly ask in the name of Jesus that you would do a work in our hearts so that giving financially and giving of ourselves would never be just something we do, but it would be a reflection of what you have done in our hearts and our lives. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each person hearing this would speak to your church, to all of us, that you would move us, Lord, to be generous in all that we do, recognizing it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. I'm going to ask you to respond to this message in a very specific way. I'm asking every single person engaged in this service to respond by giving something. Maybe you already give. Maybe you already tithe. That's awesome. Thank you so much for obeying your God. But for others, it may be your first time, or maybe you're just going to say, I'm finally going to do it. I'm going to give God uh, his tithe, his 10%. For others, it might be, I'm going to give $5, uh, whatever it is. I, I, don't, I don't care about the amount. I just want you to respond to this message by giving something to not just hear the message, but to actually live the message. You may say, I'm not even a Christian. I'm still asking you to give because I want something for you. I want you to experience the joy and the blessings of God by giving and worshiping that way. You can give online at hollychurch.org slash give or you can mail a gift into the uh, church office. All of our giving options are on the screen. And if you want to give to our special love and action offering, you can do so online by choosing that option in the drop-down box. If you mail a gift in, just let us know that's what it's for. And uh, let's pray together. Holy Father, thank you for changing lives and changing hearts, for changing my life. And as we give, may it be like the wise men, giving from a heart of worship. Lord, bless those who give, even if they don't believe in you yet. Bless them. Let them see you at work. In Jesus' name, amen.